Welcome to worship everyone. I'd like to begin by reading a few lines from the Message Bible. It's from Psalm 116. I love God because He listened to me, listened as I begged for mercy. He listened so intently as I laid out my case before Him. Death stared me in the face. Hell was hard on my heels. Up against it, I didn't know which way to turn. Then I called to God for help. Please God, I cried out, save my life. God is gracious. It is He who makes all things right, our most compassionate God. God takes the side of the helpless. When I was at the end of my rope, He saved me. This is the God who we've come to worship today. Let us worship Him. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and His faithfulness to all generations.
Psalm 32 verse 5 says, I made my sins known to you, and I did not cover up my guilt. I decided to confess them to you, O Lord. Then you forgave all my sins. Selah. Let us pray. Almighty Father, we enter your presence, confessing the things that we try to conceal from you and the things we try to conceal from others. We confess the heartbreak, worry and sorrow we have caused that make it difficult for others to forgive us, the times we have made it easy for others to do wrong, the harm we have done that make it hard for us to forgive ourselves. Lord, have mercy and forgive us through Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
The reading is taken from Philippians 3, verses 12 to 17. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. It is morning. An incredibly young baby awakens, feeling the discomfort of hunger, a wet nappy, and a little bit of vague anxiety. The baby cries out. Nearby, a mother wakes up, attending to the cry. Soon she is in motion. She approaches the baby. She calls out the baby's name. She follows this with verbal greetings and phrases of tenderness. The baby's head turns. Its eyes grow animated. Their eyes meet. Face to face now, the greetings are repeated. Then, with her face expressive of interest and concern, the mother picks up the child, nuzzling and embracing her, while sniffing and feeling in order to determine the extent of the need. Continuing the verbal caresses all the time, the mother carries out the necessary operations of cleansing and replacing soiled clothes. The baby watches the mother's face as she works, their eyes meeting frequently, Picking up the baby again, the mother produces a warm bottle or a breast and she holds the infant in her arms, perhaps rocking her gently. The baby begins to suck vigorously and as her lips and tongue and palate draw milk into her mouth and stomach, her eyes play on the face of her mother. The mother's eyes are bright and attentive, her features mobile. Frequently she speaks, producing familiar, soothing and attentive noises. As the sharp edge of her hunger eases, the baby pauses. Lifting her to the shoulder, the mother pats her on her back, all the while producing words of encouragement. After a burp or two, the feeling continues, only now it's a little bit more relaxed. We all begin the pilgrimage of faith as infants. We are newborn babies. We are born into a world and there are two things that we are certain of. 
We will live and one day we will die. But there's another thing that we are certain of. And that is that we will grow. Growth is one of the amazing facets of the universe that God has put into place. In human beings, physiological growth is maximizing your potential. We are born to grow into an adult. Uh, we know an adult is supposed to be a fully formed human being, but even adults are still growing. Children often say, when I grow up, I'm going to be bigger. And we encourage this kind of growth. And we realize that if someone is not growing, there's something drastically wrong. If someone is stuck in some, one of the phages, phases of growth, then that's quite debilitating. Now with most Christians, growth is actually part of, of our essence as Christians. But there are times when we seem stuck and we can often get stuck in a certain phase of growth and that can create obstacles to our faith actually going out, the love actually being spread to the world. We're not meant to stay in one phase of growth forever. In the same way as parents have to carry, who have to carry the burden of physical deformity in a child and how debilitating that is, we have to carry those who are crippled in our church. We are not meant as Christians to stay in phase one forever. In fact, we have a unique capacity as human beings created in the image of God for change and for transformation in our lives, in our spiritual lives as well. And one of the things we know is that we are not in the same spiritual place as everyone else. Every one of us is in a different place. Every one of us is in a different movement. And what I want to say this morning is Christianity is all about growth. Not physiological or psychological, though that's also important, but it's about a spiritual growth. And one of the metaphors that the Bible uses for our faith is the metaphor of new birth. When we come to Jesus, we are born from above. We are born again and God recreates us. A professor at Chandler School of Theology, uh, Emory University, James Fowler, is best known for a book that he wrote and his research called Stages of Faith. In this, he describes different stages of spiritual growth. So what he's done is he actually, ha actually has investigated people and their spirituality. And he has seen distinctive features which show the different phases that people are in, in terms of their faith. So let's have a look at some of those stages. I'll just summarize his stages shortly. The first stage is what he calls the infancy stage. This is the stage of total dependability. Trust and trust and trust and trust. Now the danger of this initial stage, the infancy stage, is that we can stay like babies. A baby is the center of their world. They just cry and everybody comes rushing. If we stay like babies in our faith and we stay the center of our world, we become narcissists in our faith and we feel frustrated if others are looked upon and we are not seen. People in the infancy stage often cannot tolerate others outside of themselves. So this kind of phase and this kind of approach can lead to selfish spoon feeding and if you don't do the spoon feeding then there's a big big fuss of course when you have infants in the church this of course can lead to failed relationships and isolation stage two 
is a stage where Christians can be powerfully influenced by others. So this is a stage where people are influenced by the examples and stories of faith from significant others. So when an, when an infant grows up, they, they start to watch significant others, like their parents, like those who they have a strong attachment to, and they start to reflect that and echo that. The third stage is where people start taking on some independence of belief. Often, that's the stage where they think they know best. It reminds me of, of how some teenagers work. And, well, some, some adults never grow out of that teenage phase. But people who rebel against their parents, this can lead to, a, to a, a, an attempt to control others, an attempt at perfectionism. Nothing is good enough in the world out there. This is what I believe. And, and it's, it's a good stage because what's happening is the, 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 the person in their faith is starting to take some responsibility. But on another level, uh, often people in this stage think that they, they have the, the essence of their faith is an absolute and everybody else must step in line or they're wrong. The next stage is the conformist stage. Faith provides stability and a basis for identification and identity. And in this stage, people turn to the, the judgments of others, significant others. And these Christians follow others because they're not yet sure of what they believe. And their belief comes through other people. The end of the stage is very much like someone leaving home emotionally and physically and then questioning, questioning and examining themselves, their values, their background, their life guiding values. And this is stage five, which is a more overt rebellious stage where you reevaluate what you believe, you, you, you forge your own theology and you don't live merely by the theology or the faith of others. This stage is also a stage of dis disillusionment and sometimes cynicism. Disillusioned with past compromises um, and understanding things are much more complex than you realized when you were an infant in your faith. Fowler says that people who reach this stage reevaluate consciously and unconsciously, and this leads to the next stage. The next stage, stage six, knows the defeat uh, of life, knows the defeat of, of trying to commit and being frustrated. These people are alive to paradox. They realize that truth is not just one thing. They look and see the apparent contradictions. They look beyond the surface. This is very much unlike the infant stage where all, it's all about me. This is about looking at things and, and seeing what we call the meta-narrative, reading between the lines. Now, stage seven is the phase of maturity. It's rare. And this doesn't mean that when people reach this, they are perfect. But it means that they are a human being who's greatness of commitment and vision coexists side by side with their blind spots and limitations. These people see themselves as they are. They see their own limitations. They are able to accept and embrace all people. They realize that their belief structure is not all that there is in the world. They are open to others. They, they, they tolerate others. They accept others. We reach this stage, in fact, we reach every stage only by the grace of God. Jesus said once, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, he uses there the word for maturity. It should actually be read, be whole or be mature as your heavenly father is mature. So Jesus is not looking for a clinical kind of perfection. He's looking for us to grow towards maturity. 
So this is an incredibly brief overview of these stages. Uh, in fact, I think there are many other stages. But the important thing is to keep in mind that it has been scientifically documented that people can grow in their faith. It's normal. And in Christianity, in our faith, it's a necessity. So I want to say just a few short things about growth. The first one is growth is a gift of God. The ability to grow is a gift of God. It's something that is given us and it is innate. If we do not grow, there's a problem. I'm getting to my next page. In Colossians 2 verse 19 we read, And holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God. We grow into maturity. It's quite interesting for me that God never just created spiritual adults, but it's a process. It's a beautiful process. Each one has its place. And in each one, we are moved further on to a different level. But over all of this, our Father watches us and nurtures our growth. Secondly, reject negative growth. In James 1, it says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has power to save your souls. Get rid of rank growth. When we see, look at ourselves properly, we, we look ourselves in our so-called spiritual mirror, and that is Jesus. We need to look at the areas of our life where we are growing in a way that's not quite um, like Jesus. And that may mean that we, we look at ourselves and we see some form of deformity, maybe a lack of acceptance, maybe an intolerance of others, maybe a judgment of others. And it's that kind of growth that we need to reject. Thirdly, the aim of growth is maturity. If full human potential is the, is the aim of physical growth, what is the aim of spiritual growth? The Bible is very clear. The aim of spiritual growth is Jesus. Not only that we grow for Jesus, but that we grow into the image of Jesus. That doesn't mean becoming Jesus. It means reflecting Him, following Him in everything that we do. In Ephesians 4, verse 13, we read, Until all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the full measure of the stature of Christ. We grow to become like Jesus. Fourthly, we can get stuck. Christians can get stuck in a stage of growth. They get stuck when they allow their other interests to manage their growth. If we are growing and we allow the interests of finance, the interests of, of um, external things to form our growth, then we are going to grow into something that that will not fully look like Jesus. Fifthly, we mature by listening and learning from God in Christ. In Colossians 1 verse 28, we read, It is He whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. How do we become mature? We learn and we listen. And we listen by learning. And we learn by listening. In Hebrews, Paul says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic elements of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who, who lives on milk is still an infant and is unskilled in the word of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose faculties have been trained 
by practice to distinguish good from evil. If our growth is stunted, we may have to start at the basics. If any sports team fails, you hear people saying, let's get back to the basics. Start to do the things that you do at, did at the beginning. So if you feel that you're not growing, don't vegetate. Go to the scripture, go to Jesus and connect with him. Connect with, with people who are mature in the faith. And by mature in the faith, I don't mean those who are most pious, but those who are most loving. And then you will be able to go into the next phase. Don't try to grow faster than God grows you. We cannot grow faster. A little baby doesn't sit there after it's been born and just say, yeah, and then just grow into something like an adult. It takes years. It takes years. I watched a video the other day and it was a time-lapse video and a man placed some, some soil into a box and then he had a glass put at the front so you could actually watch what was going on in the soil. And then he placed a seed in the ground and pushed it slightly down into the soil, covered it up, and then he takes a, something with a spray, spray gun water thing and he sprays on the top and this little plant is watched. And soon you start to see little roots grow out the bottom of the seed. And then you see something come from the top of the seed, which is some of the, the leaves. And the leaves press through the soil and go up and stand higher. It's something quite spectacular. And then what he does is he places a little trellis, a trellis in the form of a cross, in the soil. And you watch as this little shoot starts to grow up and then seeking something to hold on to, it grabs onto the cross, this trellis, and it curves around it, grasping it, and it starts to grow into what it is to become. This is our purpose in maturity, is to grow into what we are. That's the beautiful thing about growth. Growth is not something that is um, put onto us. It's something that we have potentially in us. So when we grow, we're actually growing into who we are. And that's very true of us as Christians. One of the other things I want to say is that growth is not easy. We experience growing pains right into maturity. And in fact, the, the fastest growth takes place through hardship and pain. And there's never a time in our lives when hardship and pain is not an aspect of growth. James says, he says, let endurance have its full effect so that you may be, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. I don't know what point I'm on now, but maybe eighthly, Give new Christians the freedom to grow. Allow other people the freedom to grow. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed. See, everything has become new. Allow other people to make mistakes. Love them through the learning curves. Tolerate them and embrace them. Be sensitive. I remember as a little boy uh, playing in one of my first soccer games. It was an impromptu game. We used to sit and watch other people playing. And then one day they didn't have enough players and they said, do you want to play? And I was thrilled. So I played in, in this game. And at one stage of the game, I was standing somewhere near the goal. I didn't have a clue as to what I was doing. I was just standing near the goal. And suddenly someone passed the ball right in front of me and I just moved towards it, kicked it. Now, the, the, the goal mouth was lit about a couple of centimeters away from where I kicked it, and I scored a goal. And I was so thrilled that I did what modern footballers do. I ran 
across the field. I've made circles. I, I, if I could, I would have done pirouettes. And at one stage I stopped and I looked around and everybody was looking at me strangely. And one of them basically looked at me and his look was, so what, you scored a goal. You were three centimeters away from the goal. It felt terrible. I can still feel it now as I tell the story. Don't rob others of their joy, of, of what they can do, even if it's, you can do much more. Don't rob them of that. The other thing about growth is that growth happens not in isolation. It happens with people. Paul says in Ephesians 4, But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, even Christ. From him, the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The picture is of a body, different parts, every part being important, every part needing the other part. Now, the last thing I want to say is that we are called to grow into something that's fragrant. Being with Jesus was something that was fragrant. It made a difference. It was, it was beautiful. Now, a few days ago, Pam came into the office and she brought what is called a Buddha's claw. I'm going to quickly get it so you can see what it looks like. She actually brought this to, to scare some of you church members because um, uh, she wanted to, to put it on um, Lydia's desk and to see what the reaction of people was. Lydia took one look at it and said, no, she doesn't want that on her desk. So I, I decided to take it and to, to put it on my desk and um, I, um, I placed it there. So that's what I, I took a few photographs. Now, a few days later, I came into my office and there was a strange smell in my office. It was a beautiful smell. It felt, it, it, it was like, as if someone had used a cleaning agent that had the most subtle, beautiful fragrance. And you could, you could actually, it, it took away every bad smell. It was just a beautiful, perfect smell. And I didn't know what it was. I actually asked, well, did you vacuum the carpet with a certain spray or did anybody have perfume? In, in the office and then I realized that what this was was the the fragrance of this Buddha's claw it had a subtle fragrance that had been released into the air and you could you could smell it and it made a difference and it still is making a difference in my office so if you, if you want to please come to the office and and see what the fragrance is like but for me growth is about fragrance it's about having the fragrance of Christ. It's about uh, having a fragrance that is so beautiful that people are drawn to us. People experience through our love the beauty of Jesus. So, Christians of BPC, at whatever stage you're in, at whatever part of your faith, whether you're right at the beginning or whether you really at a, at a stage of maturity, remember that you're called upon to continually grow. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that you would grow us, that you would also help us to see when we're stuck in a certain phase and to, to do what is needed to think differently to act differently. May we be a sweet smelling fragrance to you and to others. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are the light of the world, guiding our steps on your path. Your word says that you are a good Father who gives us good gifts. Thank you for the gift of the church a community of your children that you have gathered together to worship, 
serve, pray and love. Give us strength to live as ambassadors for you in the world. Lord, bless your church and keep us pure. Make your face shine upon us. Turn your face towards us and give us peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forever. Amen. <laughs>